Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join in in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and people in the music community. And please feel free to share, subscribe, and like. Today I have the great pleasure of having two great friends who have a, a movie company, a filming company, uh, uh, they're musicians. The company is called Fogo, F O G O. Please, uh, Francois Lamoureux and Pierre Lamoureux. I I'm really happy that you guys finally could take the time to join me on this. Thank you for, for doing this. Um, before, before getting into discussions about shaping your journey, um, why don't you each, or, or tell us a little bit for the people who don't know you personally, who don't know the background, uh, just the beginnings, like where you're from a little bit, a little bit of background. Well, shaping my journey for me, you know, uh, we're brothers, obviously, for people that don't know us, and he's my older brother. And he shaped my journey, and now I'm taking sort of his shape, and we've sort of melded into the one shape, and we sort of look the same now, <laughs> which we did it for most of our lives. But all jokes aside, um, you know, we're from northern Ontario, from Sudbury, Ontario. Um, grew up there, and my father was an education mercenary, a superstar, and he used to move around a lot. So we moved around. I remember by the time I was born in 1970, we moved around every two to four years till I was 17. So I, I changed houses every at least two to four years growing up. And, and that makes it so you, you make friends quick. And also my big brother, and we have a sister in between us, Sylvie. And, uh, you know, I would watch my older brother uh, do stuff. And of course I wanted to, you know, do what he used to do. But we we're definitely from Northern Ontario, lived in Ottawa and Toronto, North York and Penetanguishene, Ontario, LaFontaine, Ontario. And he went to McGill and I followed him. And uh, that's a quick little snippet. Pierre, do you want to talk about a bit about yourself? I mean, you were more of a sports guy to start off, right? Well, yeah, sports and music was, was really the ultimate combination for me. And uh, at one point, it just shifted uh, when I was 17. And um, it was around that time that I met you. You were a, a music teacher at a summer camp I went to. That's so right. that, that, was a, that was a pivotal year in my, uh, in my journey. Um, yeah, so that, that's a good start. Yeah, no, it, it's it's funny, Pierre. Uh, I remember that really well. It was my teacher, Pierre Belus. I was studying at McGill at the time, and I, I was, I'm from Ottawa originally, and uh, I moved to Montreal to study at McGill. And then at one point, Pierre Belus was uh, asking me to sub for him all over the place. I think it was my second year university, and he sent me to this uh, camp that he was asked to do in uh, near Cornwall, right? If I remember right. well, and um, and it was fabulous. I mean, I was probably the youngest of all the, the the teachers there. All the the teachers there were from McGill or from the Conservatoire, and I remember you were in the class. And uh, I mean, we had fun. We played concerts. I saw photos recently of of that, and somebody actually sent me another photo, and I was like. This skinny, I had a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Oh, it's that the camp was That's called. That's right. But, but the secret, although the secret that people don't know, because they don't even know what our instruments are yet, but Pierre was a trumpet player at that camp. Oh, that I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you then you switched to percussion or you added percussion? Yeah, a little bit. And then, you know, he, he, he was always hitting things. <laughs> including me, including me as a kid taking slap shots in the basement. Hey, you be the goalie, little kid brother. But no, he definitely was a was a guitar guy at the end. And but uh, talk about your your musical. That's, well, that's uh, after here. after that core after that camp, I um, I went to that camp for two years. It was in two different places around Cornwall. And after the second time, I went to Cambrian College to study classical guitar. And uh, um, trumpet first, though. trumpet first. Then I switched to classical guitar, and I auditioned at McGill in classical guitar. And uh, and after two years, I switched to jazz bass. And that, that was my wow. educational journey. And, and the reason I had to switch to bass was uh, <clears throat> when I did my first uh, my first recital at McGill, like the first um, jury recital. I came out of there thinking, I. Uh, Probably got a B. I didn't play that great, but it wasn't that bad. 
And later on that summer, I got my report card back and I ha actually had a D <laughs> for my jury. But all my other notes were, you know, A and A minus. And, and the dean summoned me and he goes, we, it's very weird. Music students usually excel at their instrument and they suck at ear training and they suck at history and they suck in theory. But you have all that, but you can't play your guitar. <laughs> so... So part of my problem was I was playing too much rock and roll on the weekends and it would break my nails and, and my hands would shake from playing too hard on my bass. And it's really hard to go to a delicate instrument after you play with blisters and things. Huh? So he said, OK, well, what do we do? I said, well, I don't know. He goes, do you play jazz? I said, nah, kind of, but not, not, not really, and not at the way I should. And he goes, well, let's have you meet Michel Donato and he'll decide if he, if he takes you as a student. And I met Michelle and uh, legendary bass player, right? Yeah, so yeah. Played Oscar, with Oscar Peterson, too. right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And we got along really well. And uh, so it was very generous of him to let me in. And I learned a lot in the last two years and I, and I graduated. Wow, he, Pierre doesn't tell the story. <laughs> he told that Adam Help saw us. his hands. Help he, us saw hands. he saw his hands and he said, Hey, those hands, it's a, those are stand-up bass hands. He says, I wish I had this. Yeah, I've got the freaking hands, right? So sure enough, he he goes into the bass. And, you know, a funny story, although since we're here to tell funny stories, it, it's, you know, he's this is 1980. He got to Montreal in 83-ish. Yep. <clears throat> so, you know, he's switched to bass in 85, 86-ish. And little did we know uh, that my uncle, our uncle, Ricky Lamaru. He was a professional musician in Northern Ontario. And we know him since we were kids. He would always play the corn boils, playing piano, great piano player. But we never fully realized just how great he was. And fast forward to 2004 or whatever, CBC do one of these family music TV shows, Histoire de Famille. So they fly us out to Saskatoon to do part of the TV show, the, the Lamroux family. So Ricky Lamroux, Pierre and Francois. And they bundled us up with the Biddle family. So there was Charlie Biddle, junior and senior, and the, I forget her name now. Oh my God. Anyways, it was the Biddle family. So Charlie Biddle, also legendary bass player from Montreal. Yes. So we were in Saskatoon, and my uncle, you know, Charlie Biddle sees him and he goes, Man, I haven't seen you since 68. Where have you been? And he knows my uncle really well. And he goes, Yeah. And he goes, This guy was one of the best piano players, and he disappeared. And, it's like I'm thinking to myself, Uncle, wouldn't it have been nice for you to like tell Pierre since he was in jazz bass that maybe he knew Charlie Biddle? It would have probably saved him a lot of time and effort. And I could see how they were friends and they had played together in the 50s. And it's like, oh my God. And he never thought of, oh, I never, never occurred to me to. He had the hottest jazz club in Montreal. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it would yeah. have told Pierre. And that's how connections work. Like, but he, it never occurred to him. Yeah, it'll work out by itself. So eventually, we'll see. You met him now, <laughs> but it would have helped me as a kid <laughs> had I known Charlie Biddle. No kidding. Anyway. That's mm. amazing. That's a, that's an incredible story. It's funny how those things happen and, and the surprises. I mean, it's a little bit like not the same kind of story, but I grew up one day seeing my father, when they were still in Ottawa, uh, playing a tambourine, like a tamborello Southern Italian. And I'm already touring the world, and I'm saying, bye-bye. All my life, I've never seen you talk, even talk about it, never mind playing it. Mm. But he played it. I'm, he said, I'm going to New York. I'm going to L.A. I'm going everywhere to study with all of these people because I want to learn. And you better play better than them put together. <laughs> 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 and so, it's, I mean, it has to do, that's a different thing. But that was, you know, as an immigrant, you, you, you kind of put things aside. It's a loss of cultural memory, if you, yeah. for lack of a better word. So that was a whole different context, which is a shock. But in your context, you're all right in it, and somebody doesn't talk about the most obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so funny the way things have evolved, that, and you know this. It's rare that Aldo we get a chance to talk like that about what we've done, and you know, fast forward to our career as filmmakers, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later that we got to work with you know a lot of our heroes as kids and all the musicians we we loved and. The amount of great drummers we've worked with and the bass players and guitar players and overall musicians is yeah. staggering. But our journey as musicians, you know, we never knew we would become filmmakers and, and audio producers and recorders right. and mixers. Our goal was always to, well, my goal was always to play music. And uh, 
a little, I think you'll find this interesting. You know, I, he's seven years older than I am, six and a half years. And uh, so when I was, I was three, I started violin and I, I loved playing violin. It was great, you know, and he was playing piano at the time. And uh, I realized that I wanted to play piano too, for one big reason. Now I didn't tell my parents what the reason was. I go, I want to play piano too. Well, okay, you got to leave the violin. Yep, happy to do that. Is I noticed that when you played piano, you never had to practice. So <laughs> great. So I took up the piano and then I realized I'm six years old. I go, oh no, you have to, there's actually two things to read. Oh no, I want to go back. And you actually have to practice. Well, my brother never practices. And I realized that it wasn't the piano, it's just he wasn't practicing. So I, I labored on the piano. It's like, oh my God, you know, I had a fantastic East German teacher in Toronto, Miss <coughs> Colin, who was who would basically never stop playing, you know. And so I, I would play little Schubert stuff and Next thing you know, these giant, her giant cat would come in with a bird in its mouth. And she goes, she saw it, don't stop. She would, the piano, cat would go under the piano, the bird would fly over the place and I would never stop playing. And she would hit me on the fingers. And so eventually I saw he was playing guitar. Well, I want to play guitar too. So uh, he ended up buying me a ukulele for Christmas. Nice. When I was 10 years old, I, 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 Christmas of 79, I got a ukulele. And uh, so I got a ukulele for my brother and some lessons, and I, I took the ukulele lessons. And at school, they played ukulele, but I wasn't allowed to take ukulele at school because I took private piano lessons, and they didn't think it was fair. Your parents can afford private lessons, eh, school lessons, you, know, you don't need them. Little did I know my guitar teacher had tuned the ukulele like a guitar. So when I played at school with my friends, nothing worked. Like I tried to play the same thing, but I didn't know why. So one day I get to my ukulele lesson and I, I took it out of my bag. It was this flat. There was a kid that had jumped on my school bag and I just realized after that he crushed my ukulele. So my teacher was really old. My guitar teacher, Mo, was really old. He must have been 37, right? He was really, really old. And so <laughs> yes. as I took my, my, uh, my ukulele pizza, I started crying. He goes, kid, this is the best day of your life. You know, I've been waiting to do this. I've been tuning the thing like a guitar the whole time. You know, I haven't been playing ukulele, you're playing guitar. Here, take the guitar. And he gives me a guitar and I'm, <laughs> trust me, ukulele bad, guitar good, much better. So I took the guitar from that point on and uh, started playing guitar and uh, I got really good at it in, in, in a few months. And the day, last day of school, June, I think June 24th, 1980, we, we, were, we were moving to Penetang. My father was going to get a job. And the last day of school, I sold my motocross bike and I was showing off that it could do jumps and I crashed and I face planted on the gravel and I had all gravel in my mouth and I was bleeding and I got home and my mom, she goes, what's going on? I'm bloody. And she's taken the rocks out of my mouth and she gave me my first guitar because it was rented the guitar before. So the day that I face planted on the gravel with marbles in my mouth and gravel she gave me my first guitar and i remember being all concussed and i got my first guitar that day and um so i, I kept playing guitar then he went to school and <coughs> was told that i had to learn how to play a wind instrument because at, at high school you had to play with it so i go i, I want to play saxophone so i kept but i had kept playing piano the whole time i took my my piano lessons with miss Coland. i had guitar lessons with the old guy 37 years old mo and then I started playing saxophone with my cousin, who was the music teacher at Penetanguishing High School. So I started taking lessons with him. And uh, so I started doing that. And my parents used to go to Toronto every couple of weeks to take lessons because in Penetang, the teachers, they weren't at that level. So I would go every couple of weeks. And one day I got to my, to my lesson. And by that time, I was playing in bands. I was writing stuff. And my brother uh, coached me on how to get royalties from my songs. I was writing songs at a very young age and I got my first royalty check when I was 13. So I was doing that and I got to my guitar lesson at 14 and my teacher had quit. So my father goes, what do you want to do? You want the new teacher? Nope. So I quit my lessons that day. I quit my guitar lessons. I kept playing piano lessons a little bit, saxophone a little bit, but I basically stopped on my lessons. And you know what happened? I got really good after that. Because <laughs> you practiced. That's what I, well, I started playing and writing. Playing, I actually got right. better once I stopped. 
And I don't know what that means. I never intellectualized it. I mean, by that time, he was at, he, what Pierre didn't tell you before, is that he had a massive accident that forced him to stop sports. So he was in Cameron College in music. And I kept playing with my band. And I kept writing songs and writing songs and making money. I was making a lot of money in high school. Like, I'm talking a few thousand bucks here. And it was, it was back in the 80s. And my journey, eventually, I was uh, was really good at school, Aldo, because I kept getting A-plus on everything so I could play guitar. My parents would go, gee, you're playing a lot of guitar. A-plus, leave me alone. So you, you <laughs> skip grades, right? So I finished my equivalent CJEP high school chemistry when I was 15. And uh, I was really, really good. And I got into chemistry at Queens. And at the last second, I wanted to go into music at McGill. He was at McGill. I wanted to go to McGill in music. But I missed the auditions. So my father brings me down to the to see the dean. And funny enough, I just saw the dean recently at a McGill luncheon, John Ray. And I said, John, I was so John John Ray was the, he was the dean at yeah. the time? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I sat in his office. He's a good friend, yes. And I said, I said, hey, I want to be in music school. He goes, well, let me see who's, who's your teacher. Oh, I quit my lessons three <laughs> years ago. What? You don't take any lessons. You want to come to McGill, the best school in the country? Yeah, but... I won the, the Music Fest Best Soloist Award three times in a row. And I wrote all these tunes and I'm getting royalty checks. And he was like, what? He goes, okay, kid, here's what we're going to do. You can't get in. I'll put you through the back door as a special student. Make sure you get good marks and we'll revisit the year after. So uh, sure enough, I got to McGill. He was just finishing up. We lived together and uh, we started playing music together in the band, which we'll talk about. And I had a great first year of school. I got... A's on everything. And I, the secret is I kind of hate jazz guitar. I don't like that sound. And that bebop thing was never, but I don't like classical saxophone either. I like jazz sax and, you know, I like classical guitar, rock guitar. So I auditioned for saxophone for McGill. So I actually got in McGill through saxophone. And only when I broke my finger a couple of years later, I switched to guitar in my last couple of years. So that was my quick journey from zero to 20 years old. I graduated McGill when I was, I finished McGill when I was 20, taught high school science for three months. And at 21, I got my degree in my hand and we hit the road. So that was my, sorry, it takes so much time, but that was my. No, 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 that's good. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, John Rea, I mean, he's a, a great composer, of course. He was actually my composition teacher at, at McGill when I was really? there. Really? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and it was consequent to that that I wrote all the music to my brother's album. He was, my brother was a poet, and I, we produced an album of his works, spoken word, and I wrote all the most of the music, about ninety percent of the music, and produced the album. It was just that whole his approach to composition was brilliant. What a great person, great teacher. Yeah, mm. but yeah. you know, I I want to back up just a little bit. I I wanted to just say something about um, when you were um, your first teacher. Um, <laughs> now you guy got thrown off. At when you were at uh, in Montreal, the um, oh, come on, who played with Oscar Peterson? Oh, Just oh Michel Michelle Donato. Donato. Yes, Michel Donato. Yeah. Funny, he's. I mean, talk about a man with a joke. Like again, every second word is a joke, as you know. But he's an incredible player. Incredible. And he's. Uh, he, we brought him down at uh, to play in the rhythm section at Cosa one year, and. He and and uh, it was Josh Trager, I believe, from from Montreal. So we had a Canadian rhythm section at the camp, and there we had you know Joe Morello. We had all of these guys at the camp who were you know our our Cosa camps that we typically had, and had all of these guys there. And then I said in, in the set that uh, Joe was going to play in the in the concert, I said Joe, you know, it would be really nice if you played some of the songs, some of the stuff that you did with. Uh, uh, Dave Brubeck back in the day. So he said, sure. So we put together a whole rhythm section as sax player uh, and Michelle, and we played with Joe, uh, Joe Morello. So they did take five, of course. You know, <laughs> that was great. So, yeah. yeah. And, and Michelle, I mean, fits into like anything. And I remember playing with him um, with some flute player in Montreal. And, um, I mean, he was amazing. He would just, you know, we didn't have a rehearsal. He would just come in. 
He wasn't even reading. He was just following what everybody's doing. And he was just <laughs> waving in and out. And I'm looking at him. I said, he's not even looking at the music. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> anyway, let's move. move oh, move wait. wait. I, got, I got a funny Michelle then. Not okay. Story for you. So, uh, so I'm just starting off in jazz, right? I'm not, I mean, I liked funk. I like, you know, David Sanborn type of jazz, but I wasn't into bebop so much. But I had to learn bebop really fast if I was going to get out of McGill. So Michelle, <clears throat> one, one week, he, um, he transcribes all these bass lines for me, like blues and two fives and turnarounds. And, and he gives me like three, four sheets of stuff. And um, so, so I, you know, I learn, I learn, I'm a practice and all that, no, no problem. But a few months later, I'm back home and Francois has a little jazz band. Okay. And they're going to jazz fest. Music fest. So music we're, fest. We're, we're, we're representing the, we're going to the national finals combo and we're little kids you know on yeah, songs they're, they're 14 that 15 years old yeah. right so uh eve his bass player he's asking me for advice you know what do i do these uh minor blues bass lines so i gave him michelle donato's lines and said here play with this and learn them so he learned everything by heart and and as as they're getting adjudicated you know they, they talk over the recording oh nice bass line you know <laughs> wow well, it's, it's 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 exactly that so we we didn't know anything about jazz that that interesting. I have to back up a little bit. What's you're gonna love this thing? I was in that band, the rock band in high school, writing my own stuff. And the the band teacher says, "Hey, we're gonna make a jazz band. We're gonna go to Vancouver at Expo '86. So we're gonna, you know, there's a competition for band for concert band. Let's get the school practices at Tuesday at five. The only people that show up." is my band, the bass, drum, and guitar player, us. Nobody shows up. The teacher doesn't show up. So I go, well, so eventually he shows up. He says, well, nobody showed up except you guys. Well, you could do some jazz. There's a combo thing. Play some jazz. I heard about jazz. I didn't really know much jazz. So I started writing some tunes, and we, we sort of played it. And I entered the jazz competition, but I kind of forgot about it. So I'm 15 years old at the time. I write, I write these tunes, and we, we practice them sort of. We're going to North Bay to play a show with my with my rock band, North Bay High School. And we remember ourselves that hold on, the jazz competition combo is 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 like the next day in Bracebridge. Oh, we forgot about that. Dad, we got to go drive down to Bracebridge to play this thing. So we go down there and Phil Nimmons, who's a legendary cl clarinet guy, he's he's our uh, adjudicator and he's talking on these things. And and we start playing and we mess it up like crazy, but it becomes kind of free jazz, but he ends up loving what we're doing. Oh, this is fantastic. Great and private. And we're completely messing up, but in a kind of a cool way. So we ended up winning that thing. So then we asked Pierre for help. And that's when he came in right around the time we made it to the next level. And we go, look, we may have a go at this thing. We won the first round. I had won the soloist award that day too. And he goes, we need some help. He goes, that's when he said, well, read these things, Eve. So he gives him these things. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so he, he starts learning these things. And that got us through. And I'll tell you how it finishes, but it got us through. And then the next time, the guy's are adjudicating, fantastic bait. But he had learned so many of them that he never repeated anything. So it was as if he was walking for real. But nobody could – it's like counting cards in Vegas. They, they couldn't figure out how he played the cards yet. So my, my, my bass player was like a god, like 15 years old. So eventually we make it to the national finals, and Gordon Foote's there and all these other guys, and they're talking like, fantastic bass playing wow you know they could but it was all michelle donato's <laughs> stuff that he had given him that he had learned everything so my bass player was like god and to this day he still plays in bar band. He goes, you know those freaking bass lines your brother gave me i still freaking use them to this day they think i'm the best bass player i haven't heard anything new since i was 15 yeah no michelle <laughs> michelle is a genius he's 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 pure genius he's crazy <laughs> Yeah, but uh, later on, when you guys uh, then you, were, you formed a band and then you you toured, right? Yeah, well, yeah. a lot of bands, you know. Uh, but here, here's the funny one: uh, Francois's last day. So we have a band called the Freight Edge, and his his last exam is I don't know wow. on a Thursday on a Thursday afternoon Thursday afternoon or whatever, and we have a gig in Kingston, Ontario, <coughs> and I said, "Tell Francois so your three hour exam." You got to finish it in two. No, an hour and a half. An hour and, <laughs> an hour and a half. Because we got to go. So, um, so that that was that was a funny thing. But the funniest thing was when, uh, so our, our our singer, 
lived in New York City and he was a recording engineer and he worked at Grammy Vision Studio, which was a legendary jazz label and they had their own studio. Yeah, John Schofield, Ornette Coleman were on there. Taj Mahal, a whole bunch yeah. of people, yeah. So, um, so we're trying to get to New York to go record because we had free studio time on the weekend. And, uh, and we're trying to go, but we have to leave like on a Wednesday or something like that. And Francois has to miss choir at McGill. And that's like sacred. You're not supposed choir, to miss choir. Choir, but other things too. The choir. Yeah, the choir was the big one. And they wouldn't let him go. They, 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 and we tried a few weeks ahead of time and it was like they, they wouldn't let him go. So we knew the A&R guy at Grammy Vision. And he signed Francois to a record deal. <laughs> Yeah, he, we, it was a letterhead, Grandma Vision, and I. So I gave it to Gordon Foot. He goes, "What? You got a record deal? You're going to record in New York? You're 18 years old. What the hell's going on?" You can this? miss choir, no problem. He goes, he goes, "Kid, nothing is free in life. I don't know. This is really weird. You got a deal on Grandma Vision, you know?" So he said, "We went down to Grandma Vision. That, that that was a band called the Freight Edge, and um, it was really it was a rock band. And Pierre's right. He we had a show in Kingston, and I had to finish my." meteorological science exam in an hour and a half instead of three. And I remember I left the exam and it was a hundred people in the room and everybody's furiously writing and I got it done. And I remember I leave and this guy with French Quebec accent, it goes, ben voyons. And he was so, couldn't believe I finished the exam. Like it freaked them out. People go, no way you're done. Oh, I'm done, man. I'm going to play some rock and roll. There may be girls there, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm leaving this exam. But, um, uh, yeah, so the Freight Edge was was our, uh, you know, we had a lot of bands, although, I mean, my first band was Vacance when I was in, in I was 12, 13, that's when I got my first royalty check, because we played our own songs, and then we had a band, I had a band, at, you know, kids, and it was going okay, then I had a, a bigger band in high school that we did quite a bit of money with, we did well, we played a lot, our own song, had a band with Pierre called Du Désir for one summer, and we opened up for the legendary band Cano. I was 14 years old and we had opened for Cano, which was great. And then uh, came to McGill, had a band with this guy, Serge Laforêt, who had ended up owning Audio Z. He was in charge of the Synclavia at McGill and we had a band with him. And that eventually uh, we started the Freight Edge, which was Pierre was talking about, which was Brian Martin, who was the engineer in New York and Arnold Bondi, our piano player friend from McGill who played drums. And Pierre and I, and we did that for a number of years. And eventually the singer, Brian, was too busy recording. So we started Brass Camarade, which was our main band for, for oh, about 10 years. And that came out of the fact that we were, we didn't have a singer anymore. So I decided to sing in French and we started singing in French and it took off and we went to Portugal and the whole crazy story you, you, you know of. But that was, that came out of the Freight Edge, Brass yeah. Camarade. And then we retired and then we started Fogo. So... We can yeah. expand on any one of those, but but but, well, but that, the, that well the whole I mean I, I and I I think the whole story I mean this leads us to I mean your main thing that you're doing now which is fabulous when I kind of uh, came back around and I saw you guys uh, I mean of course I knew Pierre before you Francois but when we kind of came back around it was in the context of, of Fogo and I remember Pierre showed me the uh, uh, that where the studio you had. In Montreal yeah. at the time, and then you're expanding to New York and Nashville and all of that, and then telling me about what you were doing. So I, f I found that super interesting, and of course, all that history sets you up for what you're doing. The you know f going forward, and all of a sudden now you're doing projects. I, I mean, you did projects with uh, Rush. With I mean, where do you start? Oh, no, let's start with one one in particular that I did not know about. Uh, mm. You did the Pat Metheny's orchestral. Project yeah. orchestra, right? yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I I heard Steve Rodby talking about it, um, and it's funny because Steve Rod, I played on an album with Steve Rodby, with Phil Wilson, uh, trombone player, who is a yeah. teacher at Berkeley. It was a live album called Live and Cooking. He was he was the ah. bass player on that. Yeah. Well, anyway, you, but you but played, oh, you, you played on a on another Steve Rodby project. You don't even know. Whoops. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my my I, my phone died. Yeah, you played on another Steve Rodby project. You have no idea you even played on. Oh, can you tell me that one? I played on my song, and I asked Steve to play bass on ah. one of the songs you played percussion on a year and a half ago. When whenever we the pandemic right, started, right, 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 right. Actually, Steve played on a couple of tunes. The Steve played on that. Beautiful. Yeah, after you played the the drums, he played bass on a couple on of tunes. Oh, I'd love to hear it. 
<laughs> he's, he's, a, he's great. a phenomenal bass player. I mean, it's a, yes. it's, he, he definitely has his own style. Like, you know, and that's what he said. He goes, Francois, there's a problem getting me to play on your thing. So I go, what's that, Steve? Because I'm happy to do it. Uh, it's an honor. I go, oh, that means a lot. There's a problem. I sound like me. And I go, Steve, that's, that's what we want. He says, whenever I try to like not sound like me, it doesn't work. I go, Steve, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so Pat Metheny, <laughs> that, that Pierre, Pierre uh, that, that occurred because of my brother, of course. And um, I'll let him talk about the origins of that. But the, it, it was, you know, we were always on the bleeding edge of technology um, in our film career. And that was right around the time where 3D was, it, it, it's so strange the way the 3D thing happened. It was always 3D movies. And then 3D started picking up with Avatar, which became the biggest thing. And then it died with Avatar <laughs> right. for whatever reason. It was, it, everybody saw the film in Avatar, but we, we decided to film not graphic stuff, but actually true 3D with two cameras with a mirror. And we thought that the orchestron, Pat Metheny's project would be an ideal one because he was controlling all these real instruments with his guitar. And, um, wow. You know, it filled up uh, most of a church, all these instruments, and it, it gave us depth. And we were able to film this like a true art film working with Pat. And, you know, we worked with Satriani and, and Bai and Zach Wilde and, you know, some great players, Alex Lyson, a lot of great guitar players. And they're all very, very different. But one thing I will tell you about Pat is we saw him create, it, it was such a different kind of project, but to see him play, Nonstop for 12 hours that one day. Getting better and better. And better. Yeah, and improvising. You know, I've never had to do that with anybody else to play for 12 hours and he's alone with these machines. It was just crazy. Right. No, I, w I wanted to see that live. I never, and I, I never ended up doing it. Then when I saw that you, uh, you guys had worked on it, now I'll have to see. It. Yeah, there's a DVD, out, obviously. Yeah, no, Blu ray. Get the Blu ray. Yeah. Blu ray. Okay. But that would be amazing. I mean, he was triggering samples or triggering the actual instruments being played. No, no, the instruments. The instruments. So he was Accordions, the basses. Mechanical. mechanical. It's all mechanical. Wow. Marimbas. Well, combination. There's some electronics, there's some mechanical. It's a, a lot of percussion. A lot of percussion. A lot of percussion. Marimbas and yep. uh, xylophones and glockenspiels. Oh, yeah. It's very impressive. Big drums, too. I mean, uh, and, and he had, you know, castanets. I mean, everything. It was just crazy. It's over the top, and uh, you wow. know, I think that, I think that's that's a bit in Pat's character as well. You know, he doesn't he he could have succeeded by doing half of what he did, but yeah, it, it was just so over the top that um, we just had to be a part of it. So yeah, we helped him raise the money for it, and we uh, put it together. Well, we we, we raised the money for yeah, it. We raised, it. yeah, we were, and 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 uh, well, you went to his house in New York. And his wife was like, get this out of here, because all that was in his, his, his apartment. It used to be in his apartment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's so, crazy. So when you see the film, you realize that if all that fit into his apartment, I mean, and it was like, we took it out of there. We went to Brooklyn. We did it in a church in Brooklyn, right? Yep. And uh, that was quite uh, an amazing time, although, I mean, just for one person playing all that, and there's a delayed response for him to trigger those things with his instrument. So it's really quite difficult. Sure. And it was, his whole impetus was based on a player piano he saw as a kid. And he was fascinated by the player piano. And then he took it to like triggers and air triggers and electric uh, solenoids and unbelievable. Wow. Well, the nice thing, the nice thing is, and I, I remember listening to um, a conversation or an interview where Gary Burton when when uh, when he was playing with and Gary Burton's band, and Gary actually was producing his first recordings, he really pushed him to push himself as a musician and uh, as an artist. He says, "If you're going to be doing something, don't do what everybody else has done. It's yeah. and it's not. It's it's you have to be at the level. And that's you know what Gary did with with the vibraphone. I mean, 50 years ago, uh, it was like." 50 years ahead of its time, or 100 years ahead of its time, because no one has really pushed it to that level. And Gary was like that, where he pushed not only the improvisation, but also what can the instrument do? And, and I think that um, leaked into Pat's 
whole persona, a whole way of thinking. If you're going to do something, you might as well do something different and push it. What else, what can this do that hasn't been done? Pushing, pushing yourself, pushing it. And, and I think he's, I mean, judging from everything I've seen, and, and this is totally in that reign, you know, yeah. where he's pushing the, the guitar, pushing the human mind to think like that and be able to do that uh, musically and uh, the technology at the same time without the technology overtaking the music, right? Because well, it's absolutely is brilliant. Exquisite. It's exquisite. Somebody could transcribe that and make it for chamber orchestra or, or whatever. The music stands alone on itself. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite, quite astonishing. You know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you work with different kind of artists and you get different relationships with various ones and there's no right or wrong relationship. You know, there, there's some you work in and you develop friendships. Other ones, you, you have a, a, a great working relationship that you don't necessarily speak to them every week. Some people you never see again, but when you, but if you do, it's as if you left off the same day you let them 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah. And we, we've had the fortune to work with so many different styles of music. A lot of people in our in our space, although as you know, and this happens with a lot of musicians, they get pigeonholed. Oh, you're a metal film, or you're just a jazz guy, or this. So you know, we've from Harry Connick to Willie Nelson to Slipknot to to, to Satriani to Dead Mouse to Usher to it's been very, very varied, and we got to work on fantastic music, being musicians, and in our journey you know, we've played a lot of instruments. So it, it, we, in trying to find our own voice, and I, I definitely found my voice. I'm definitely, I'm a musician, but my favorite way to express myself is definitely the guitar. Of course, I sing and I play saxophone. I play piano too, but I was really good at saxophone. I was, uh, I'm, I'm a much better guitar player than I was a saxophone player. Pierre is more varied than I am. You know, he played trombone, trumpet, uh, you know, he played brass and 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 reed. He played all all instruments. Um, but me, I'm I'm more I'm, I'm definitely. Although I did play drums, and I taught a lot of people how to play drums. And funny enough, Brass Canarad, we had an endorsement deal with Pearl. With no drummer. With no drummer. <laughs> so I remember uh, I remember we were at Nam and and we were hanging out, and that was a really big deal for us. When we went to to Nam because I was a Mesa Boogie guitar player. And I got to be, I met the guys and they loved the way I played. And I got a deal at Mesa Boogie. And the Daria was the same thing. And Seymour Duncan, all the stuff that I played. And uh, Rabal Gadin was very good to us. And we were playing Gadin, uh, great, great, great guitars. But uh, when we met the Pearl guys, we were changing drummers a lot. And we, or the sound would change so much. And we said, you know what? We're going we're to be a Pearl band. And the drummers are going to play what we tell them to play. And the, guy, the guys were Pearl's like, we never had that happen before. That's really kind of weird. We'll do a deal with you on that. So we were Pearl endorsed deal with revolving drummers, and they had to play the Brass Camarade Pearl kit. Right, right. Which was kind of fun. So we 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 ended up doing that. And I, I've I've always loved drums. I mean, I remember I used to get my uh, what was the can, uh, power tips. I used to buy the power tips as a kid. Those maple sticks because I loved the way they smelled, and I used to play in the, you know, I used to play drums all the time. Uh, I had to teach my band after he left my band when I was 14. I had to get new musicians, and the guy didn't know how to play drums. So I taught him how to play drums, good enough. Teach how to play bass, good enough, and we'll learn together, right? So I would teach people how to play drums, and nice, yeah, uh, very rewarding. I'd like to underline one thing that's really interesting about Francois. Uh, you know, he stopped taking lessons when he was 14, but he got he got much better. But the way he got much better was through creativity. Yeah. He was he was hearing things in his head, which forced him to become a better player. And when he achieved a certain level of skills, he could think of harder things to play. And and it, it kind of rolled like that. So it's a very interesting journey that way. And um, it was the money, Pierre. I like the royalty checks. <laughs> Write more songs. I figured Because we never really played covers all the way. Ever okay. since I've been a kid. I, and he left the freaking record player uh, to go to college. And I had nothing. And I lived in a little town, La Fontaine, Ontario, population 500. And uh, I had a book that he left me called Rock Lives, which had Beatles songs in there with little chord things. And I would play that. And I didn't know how they went. I didn't have a radio. So I would just write tunes. And I would wow. play with the guy that I taught the drums to and the freaking, and we'd meet every week and we'd play. And we started writing our own songs. And then he said, well, you know what? 
if you play your show, you can actually register with CapEx, so can it. So I registered it, and the, the way it worked back then was $25 license or 1% of the door. Well, so I used to go to people in my little town, look, my little band will play for 25 bucks. Pay the license, and we'll play. So we used to play our own songs because, you know, for 25 bucks, I'll play what I want. But I would declare that at SoCan or KPAC back then, and it fell into the pro rata. So I, I would get royalty checks every two, three months or three, four months. And it amounted to quite a bit because we played a lot of these $25 gigs, but the royalties started coming in. It was, you know, a few thousand bucks a year when you're 14 years old and you're not paying rent. Oh, so yeah. I realized, I don't want to play covers. Let's write some more tunes, <laughs> write more tunes, write more tunes. And that's how I got to the creativity level of, yeah. of, of, of doing it. But I had an easier time than my friends for whatever reason for actual soloing. I thought I learned myself, uh, and it was, but that was not my focus. It was writing songs. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I still remember those KPAC uh, <laughs> royalty yeah. checks, the good old days. Oh, oh yeah. boy. Yeah, that was fun. But um, moving forward, on, on, I'm just thinking, would you agree, like you're musicians and you're playing, but now your, your instrument has become the camera, the, the recording, but you're still making music from a different perspective. That's what I'm, I'm seeing. Yeah. You're, you're projecting your, your musicianship and your, your ideas and this uh, expansion of curiosity through your medium with all these other people, which is fabulous, right? Well, I, <clears throat> I would say, you know, my interest when I was studying, I, I wanted to be a record producer. And my idea was I, you know, I wanted to be the Hugh Padgham or the Rupert Hine or you know, the George Martin, I, I wanted to be that role. And, uh, but the musician producer. And, and when it came time for us to, to get to a certain professional point, the world had gone really audiovisual. So it was just, it's really, to me, to us, it's the same thing. We're, we're, we're producing music with, with images. And, um, and at first we let other people take care of the images, then we realized, oh, God, there's there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here so we started uh we started uh doing more and more of the things ourselves to the point where we um control everything from a to z now we we uh you know from, from right all the way to authoring and, and and whatever but um you know it, it's the, the musician producer thing was was always appealing to me francois is is, is i remember when we did our third French record, I really felt Francois had taken over that role and he was able to mix alone without me and he was able to achieve incredible results. And that was, uh, that was another turning point in, in, in our world. Uh, but, you know, doing the audiovisual thing really came from us doing about 12, 13 music videos, maybe uh, and we did two documentary films in the 90s. And, but we were just producers, but we would ask questions to the directors all the time. And we would, we really got to know a lot of it through that experience. So uh, when the, the moment came, you know, I moved to New York in 1999 and I was working for an internet company for a year and the internet company wanted to stream live concerts on, on the internet. It was way ahead of its time. And we couldn't really stream because it was like little screens like this and we had, <laughs> had to buffer. So what we did is we would film complete shows, but we would only release one song a week. And that way you could buffer your three minutes and watch the whole song. And, uh, but when I got, when I got to New York, I realized that I would experienced so many different facets of everything we need to do that I was one of the only people, there was two of us in our whole company that really had an understanding of what it meant to film things and that could have conversations with the musicians that could have conversation with the lighting director. Cause I, I did lighting, I did sound, I, you know, I, I, I stage managed, I, I did all that stuff. So um, I realized that all this training in the eighties and nineties really prepared me for that moment. And, you know, I moved to New York on October 3rd, 1999 and February 22nd, 18 weeks later, I was producing Pete Townsend in London. And that could have been my first and last if it would have blown apart. 
but we did it. We won a Yahoo Online Music Award, and, and that was the beginning of it all. And, and part of it was um, was in, in the company. It was like, well, why are you guys going to spend so much money filming this? You know, it's just a small screen. Why don't you do it? In, you know, one camera. Why don't? It was like, well, no. There's something called DVDs, which is coming out next year, and there's we need to film this as if it was on television. We need to do it as best we can with the money that we have, because one day it'll be somewhere else, and it's legacy. And and that's what interested Townsend was like that kind of vision, like, well, we're doing this for forever, you know. And and, um, and I guess that was the difference between. Today's different, but back then television was very disposable, right? They never, th today there's a lot of film on television. People make feature movies and stuff, but back then it wasn't so much that. And, but you know, when a filmmaker makes a film, it's forever. When, when a producer makes a record, it's forever. But television always has next week's episode. There's always another episode, always another episode. So the mentality is very different. So right from the beginning, I tried to steer my little group within the company and and and, and uh, to think that way because it is forever. And, and sure enough, that was the right move. And and Townsend led to Willie Nelson to Deep Purple to a whole bunch of people. And, yeah. and here we are. And then you did the Dream Theater. Oh also. yeah, you did a few projects with Dream Theater. Yeah, Dream Theater. Yeah, I know. I mean, Rush and everything. I mean, it's it's kind of a. I, I have a different way of telling the story. Uh, but he's absolutely right. My way of saying it is, is, you know, he remembers the date, October 3rd is the reason he gets October 3rd is that I got married October 2nd. Yeah. He had to move out of the apartment because, you know, my wife was moving up. So he's got to go somewhere, but knowing that he was leaving October 3rd was going to kill my band because he's my partner and bass player in the band. And we had had a pretty good run in Portugal and, and then, uh, you know, we, we decided to sing in French when we got to Portugal, we sang in Portuguese, and that was our biggest market. And and uh, but hey, he was going to leave. He was going to kill the band. I took the job with Isabel Boulay. I was her his her uh, musical director because I had done a lot of ads. I was the Budweiser guy in Canada. I'd done you know McDonald's and Burger Kings. I did tons of ads, and I'd done the <coughs> Ford Focus launch. And it, it, when you bought the car, the Ford Focus in '99, it came with a CD in it, and the CD had an Isabel Boulay song that I had written. And um, so I got the job with her. So I said, okay, well, he's going to go. And within, when I phoned him on my honeymoon, this is romanced a little bit, but it's basically that. I go, so how's the job in the mailroom at the company? <laughs> because we had met these guys in Cannes and they were impressed by us because we have these name tags at the medium and it says, you know, the name of the band and the country. But we were in the Portuguese booth. We weren't in the Canadian booth or the Quebec booth. We were in the Portuguese booth. And you go, these guys from New York are like, hold on, you're a French band from a Portuguese booth and you sing. Are you guys making any money? And we said, yeah, we're making money. He goes, well, I'm, I have idiots working for me that can make money with money. You guys should be working for us. So that's how they courted Pierre because he was booking all the shows and all these things. So anyway, so he ends up in New York. It's going to start in the mailroom. So I go, how's the mailroom job, Pierre? He goes, oh, no. I got my corner office. I can see the Goodyear blimp. I'm in Times Square. And I go, corner office? He goes, yeah. What happened? He goes, well, I had my New York moment this morning. I walked in the elevator. There's a guy in the elevator that came from the basement. And he was not happy, punching the walls, kicking the walls, talking German, you know, Scheiser, whatever the hell it is. And Pierre speaks German. So he starts talking to him a little bit. And he noticed they're going to the same floor. So the guy goes, well, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I'm starting my, my new job. He goes, oh, what, what other languages do you speak? He said, well, I speak French, English, German, Spanish, and Portuguese. The doors open. Again, it's a bit romance, but the, but the doors open up, and he goes, he, he says, I'm the CEO of this company, and nobody speaks German. He is now the heads of international because say he speaks German. So I go, what does head of international mean, Pierre? He goes, I have no idea. I got a corner office, and I'm the head of international. So they were doing internet downloads back then, and they realized it wasn't viable. And one day, the CEO calls a meeting. He goes, okay, we are now going to pivot the company. Who here has now experience in putting concerts? Pierre lifts his hand. You're also now the heads of production. <laughs> Again, I'm exaggerating, but that's basically what happened. And sure enough, right, Pete Townshend happens, the Lifehouse, and next thing you know, 
we could tell stories all day, uh, although, but, you know, it, it ended up <laughs> Willie Nelson. And next thing you know, I start mixing a lot of things and we start winning awards for best audio. And so the German CEO goes, OK, we'll give it to Pierre's brother because he wins the awards on the audio. And next thing you know, we start doing this and Pierre leaves the company in New York and we started Fogo. That's basically a sh very short version of it. And it's been 22 years that we've been doing these things and you know, got a couple of Emmys and Grammy and Junos. And we got to work with pretty much all of our heroes as a kid. Yeah, a few missing, but they're couple almost missing, all there. Almost all there. Yeah. Roger Waters. Yep. Roger. We worked with Roger a few times and uh, yeah, he's great. I mean, he, there's an interview I'm doing with him and he busts my balls at the end and then he, he laughs and it, it was great working with Roger. At the beginning. Oh, at the beginning. That's right. Now he did bust my balls. Yeah. Yeah. So Roger, yeah. Well, Roger was great. He asks him a question and Roger looks at him and goes, now that's a really stupid question. A really bad question. <laughs> and, and his manager guys beside him, he's looking at him like, what did you do? Because he didn't hear the question. He goes, no, it's, it's a very good question. <laughs> so he saved me there. We, we had done a show in New York called Speakeasy that Pierre and I were producing with these other guys on PBS. And uh, the interesting part about that show was that the interviewee picked the interviewer. So he came on the show and he picked, uh, I forget the guy's name now. From Bill, Bill Weir from CNN. Yeah, CNN. Yeah, so he did a, an hour interview with him. And uh, we did the show and it went really, really well. And eventually... Another brick in the wall of the opera was happening in Montreal, and we, Karen and I, got involved with that, uh, and we were able to become, uh, you know, we basically funded the filming and and was able to uh, to film the show and record it, mix it, and uh, in, interact with Roger a little bit, which was, was was great, and have him up for the premiere of the show, and he was very gracious, and uh, we actually did that in VR. We actually shot that in VR at the wow. time, yeah, which was great. So Roger, yeah, I got to work with Roger a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah, he's done so much. At, what would be another? I mean, you, you, another. Um, I remember tragically hip. You were you were doing something. Yeah, the, the hip, the hip. That was a life changing thing, and uh, I'm going to go on record because I'm not I'm not ashamed of it at all. But when I was younger, I didn't actually like the tragically hip. I just I and I. You know there what? a band that grows on you though. Well, one of those, right? It, it, I, I didn't, I didn't not, I didn't not like them, but I didn't love them, and uh, and the reason was is I didn't understand them. And when I took a course at McGill, there was a course called Bible and the Western Culture, and I took that course. And there was this old guy; he must have been fifty-five, really old. And uh, <laughs> you know, so he was talking hey. about about art, and he said the Bible. He says the Bible is really important even if you don't believe in it, because there's so many references in literature. And if you don't understand the Bible, you're going to miss out on 2000 years of New Testament references to the thing, and you're going to be lost. So, you know, think of how this can help you, even if you don't believe. The other thing he said that was really profound, and it comes back to Gord Downey, is he said that when you watch the Mona Lisa, <laughs> you think she's pretty? Yeah, I don't really care if you think she's pretty or not. You, you, if you don't like the way she looks, that's fine. But he says, if you if you don't get to appreciate it, you're an idiot because millions and tens of millions of people, centuries of people have told you that this is the gold standard. You may not agree, but you have to at least make the effort to understand why hundreds of millions of people over centuries have decided it is. And if you choose not to do that, you're showing your ignorance. And that that is a very powerful thing in music. I don't like that too. And I, that band, I hate it. Well, you really know about well, why is everybody like them? So if you can if you can understand why they like them, you may actually learn something. So we 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 got the call to go work with the hip and Universal phoned us up. Hey, go to Edmonton, Pierre Francois, fly out there. And um, you know, the band wants to meet you. We we would like you to work with them to film. Okay. And I Pierre. Was Gordon still alive at the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is 2002, three. Okay. Yeah, 2003. So he says, uh, I go, Pierre, do you really love the hip? No, I don't really love the hip. Me neither. Well, we'll go. So we go to Edmonton. We get to the place, the hotel. And the guy from Universal is there. And he goes, okay, here. Here's the way it works, guys. The hip had been together since high school. They're friends. 
They're all equals, okay? All everybody's equal, but Downey decides. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was sort of it. so we're like, oh, okay, and the door opens, Kunk! and everybody's there and they're talking to us. And and uh instantaneously, I think I speak for Pierre on this, we fell in love with the guys like that. You can't not, not like those guys. And I remember, I think it was Gordon Downey says, okay, well, we want to film in Toronto. I think it's next week or in two weeks, whatever. I go, well, why there? He goes, well, because it's sold out in a second. And Pierre goes, that's great, Gord. If it's sold out, where are we going to put our cameras? Because he knew that we had to block off seats, but it's oversold. He's like, I hadn't really thought of that, right? <laughs> so we made a design and, you know, Pierre had a big hand in that, that we actually, instead of hiding the cameras, they would be kind of a part of the show. And we wouldn't try to hide because we couldn't hide them because we, the, it, was, it was sold out at the ACC. So we start working with them. And what ended up happening is that I got to understand it from a perspective. Whenever you work with a band, it's sort of like you watch TV. We like to get into the TV. Oh, that's, oh, that's how that is. Like you try to understand the band as much as you can. And as soon as we got into what we understood, it made them special. And they got to be one of my favorite bands. And what ended up happening is we, we had to do something that we had never really done before. And what's that? We had to use split screens. Why do we have to use split screens? Well, Gord would do a lot of monologues while the guitar solo is happening. So if you saw the guitar solo, you're missing out on Gord. If you show Gord, you're missing out on the guitar solo. So Pierre and I, we with our editors, we organized this whole thing with split screens, and it, it's pretty cool. And we took zero time out of the film. So it was, it was back to back the way it was. So we, we go down to Bath through the studio. We meet with the band. We play it for them. They love it. And Gord Downey goes to Pierre and I, let's go outside. Because here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is we've decided what the name of this is going to be. It'll be called The Tragic the Hip That Night in Toronto. So when you go to the Walmart or Sam the Record Man, whatever it is, when you when the receipt will it'll say that whole name, not the hip, the tragic hip that in Toronto. But there's a kicker, guys. It'll say a film by Pierre and Francois Lammer. And he says, You guys have to promise me now from this point forward, every time you do a concert film, you must promise Gord Downey to put a film by Pierre and Francois Lamoureux on the cover, not on the back loss. You have to put it somewhere because what you've done is extraordinary and you need to be listed on there. So fast forward, we get a call from the CEO of Universal. He goes, who the freaking guys are you guys? I got a call from Gord Downey that the name of this thing has to be the tragedy hit that night in Toronto, a film by Pierre and freaking Francois Lamoureux on the receipt. Really? Who are you guys? And we became friends with him, Randy Lennox. We became really close with him. But Gord changed our lives uh, in making us realize that, you know, uh, it, was, it, it was just an amazing time. So we love the hip. And today we're actually transferring and we're backuping all their archives. We're in charge of their, of their archive life. So the tragedy wow. were extremely close to us. And it was a big humbling experience. Again, like the Bible in Western culture, we hadn't understood. But once we understood, we love them. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you bring up a really good point, you know, this whole thing of, of giving credit always, you know, whether it's your teacher, whether it's your what, whatever you're involved in, someone who opened the door, you must always credit because you, you, we don't do things alone. We do what we do well by ourselves, but in a context and that giving that credit always and you and you look at anyone who's who's was open, really open, and made sure that everybody got credit all the time for what they did was were the most successful ones, 100%. and the more, most lasting ones. It's a very good point, although, and it's really profound how even if you here's here's an interesting conundrum, and sometimes I wonder what happened to me and Pierre and yourself. So one day I had done, I'd written music for a film, <laughs> speaking of credit, when I was writing those commercials, I was a ghostwriter and I would be paid a lot of money not to have my name on there. And I was in my twenties and I, I wasn't a willing participant at first. It just became that the check's getting, getting bigger and bigger. And I go, yeah, but my name's not on the thing. Yeah, but we've paid you a lot of money. And it, so we started winning awards and best soundtrack, but I, I couldn't get any awards because my name wasn't there. And it became a bit of a problem. One of the films that I wrote the music, a lot of the music for, not the whole, but a lot, it was an art film called Le Petit Musée de Velasquez, which is Malada Human Steps. 
and it won all sorts of awards. Yes. And, uh, and I know it's, it's just an amazing film. But the point is, is I was living on Mont Royal and Henri Julien, Mont Royal. There's a little park there called Le Parc de Relais. And I was with my daughter, who was at the time about two. And I got in the park and I see the main dancer of La 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 Human Steps, Louise de Cavalier. Now, this is Louise, about yes, yes, yes. eight years after I wrote the film and won all sorts of awards. And I never got a chance to talk with her. And here she is in the sandbox with her daughter. And I'm in the sandbox with my daughter. And we're sitting beside each other watching our kids play. Now, you cannot know who she is if you know dance. Because <laughs> She's immediately of because of her hair and her, her persona. And I go, hey, do we? It's incredible. You know, hey, you know, I didn't know how to really say it, but I go, I'm a big fan. And, you know, I actually wrote a lot of the music for the film. So we started talking about it. And she goes, you know what? I, she says, I never saw the film. I never, I ended up seeing the whole thing. I, I remember doing it, but I, I don't like watching. I'm a live, live person. And I, I believe in live, live. So we started talking about it. And she blown me away. And she goes, excuse me. And she gets up and she walks and I look what she's walking to. And there's a little girl, six or seven in the park, dancing, jumping with the butterflies and this and that. And she goes and talks to her and she says, be careful when you jump that way because when you land, you could twist your knee and you may want to do this this way. And she's given her, she's one of the greatest contemporary dancers of all time. Oh. And this little girl, is in the park. Her parents aren't even there. She's dancing, but she doesn't know she's getting a freebie from a master. Yes. But it doesn't matter that it's a master. She, this person's giving to her, and she has no idea. And she'll always remember. Remember in the park one time, like she goes to dance. Says, "You're supposed to do it this way." Well, where'd you learn that? Like she'll never know. Right, but that right. would, it makes it absolutely beautiful. And I remember being in music stores as a kid because I could kind of play when I was younger. Remember some old guys try this, right? I don't know who those guys were. Maybe it was it was Jimmy James as a kid, or maybe it was it was it was who who knows Carlos Santana walked that Steve. But I remember some old guys as kids, as, as a thirteen year old kid, giving me who was that guy? I don't know, yeah. but he imparted something. I may never saw him again. So when giving credit, there's that unknown soldier kind of musician that comes in that you never know can have a huge part of your life. No, no, of course, yeah, yeah, no, that's important. I mean, I remember. Louise Cavalier, when they were involved with David Bowie, did yeah. a whole show, and he he spent a lot of time in Montreal, and they're a big part of that show. I mean, that whole contemporary, because what Louise Cavalier and that whole la 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 human steps was at the time was so ahead of its time, it was unbelievable. Well, that I that mean, was a bit of a problem because that you're so right because the movie when I got called to to the studio it was December twenty second, I remember it very well. And I walk in the studio, I go, what are we doing, guys? This. And they play. And I go, oh, that's all the human steps. And I go, great. I go, and so they play it. And I go, well, where's the music? Well, that's the problem, Francois. We have to write the music. Well, what did the hell did they dance to? David Bowie. But they can't get all the rights. So, they, so Edouard Luck had choreographed all sorts of stuff to really known music. But it, because of the audiovisual sync rights, there was no way they could clear the licensing. So they got these guys at the last minute to compose to the dance. You never wow. do that. So for two days, two and a half days, we spent 15 hours a day. Got to be maybe even more. I think I slept there even. And we composed music to the dance. Wow. And we weren't even allowed to hear what they had done before because they got in trouble. We didn't even know what they danced to other than it was Bowie. I don't even know what songs they were. So we had to look and figure out the tempos and I had a percussion, I forget his name now, with me. And so we, we ended up doing, writing the film to dance. It's mind-boggling. Wow, that's fantastic, man. But, you know, the, the, the giving credit thing, I remember um, in Montreal way back, and I, I had this discussion with somebody else. I once got fired. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, more than once, but... <laughs> But this one was really special because I was doing a lot of studio work at the time, playing with you know everybody in town. You know that that whole scene back it was back in the early '80s. I was going back and forth from New York, and it was, and all the albums I would buy, 
always gave the credits. You know, Steve Gadd, Will Lee, and you know everybody who who's Ralph McDonald on percussion. So everybody knew who was who, and so you listen for the next record. And there, these are not the the artists' record. These are the guys making the records for the artists, which became huge. And so we, we this singer, I won't mention the name, had a big hit. We toured, um, and then when we did the next album. Uh, we did the, the, the bed tracks live in the studio at the time, you know, just the, the basic tracks in one afternoon, probably in the, you know, a little over a session or something, we did it, and it sounded great. And then they went and did the overdubs, and then we were just about to leave, and I, and I said to the producer, um, I said, you know, it would be really great if you credited the musicians on this one, because here at the time, nobody was getting credits on, a, on the sleeves, if you, if you remember that far back or look that far back. And I said, you know, Ooh. here there's a lot of great musicians who play on all the records, your guys' records, and they're not getting the credits. And it would be great. And then he said to me, well, you know, we can't afford to, to, to do that. I said, well, just do an, an, an insert. Well, we can't afford to do that. So I, I said, well, okay, I'll pay for it. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I said, if, you, if it's a problem of, of that, I'll, I don't care. I'll pay for it because I think it would be the right thing to do. And it would be nice that all the guys here, and this is going to be a hit, probably. Um, of course, we got paid. You get a great record. Well, what could it possibly cost? And it ended there. <laughs> it ended there. So, when the of course I wasn't invited to the record release, yeah. and I did and I didn't do the follow up tour, so I was <laughs> I was done. But I did get the record, and everybody was credited. Oh, good. And then since oh. then, then other people saw that, hmm. and I I just think it's important. The recording engineer, like everybody, was a part of that. Just putting it in print and giving credit to people who did something. Absolutely. You know, so you were fired basically because of that because you offered to pay for the sleeve. Well, nobody said that. Yeah, I've only I was not. I was once. not fired. I was just not called you know, back. Called back. I was not. <coughs> You're a shit disturber. Yeah, hey, you're not supposed <laughs> to swear on this stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, man. This is all the matzo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that the different languages doesn't count. You know, I, I, I. I I never got fired, but I did not get called back for a pretty big gig, which I won't name the artist, but she was a female artist, very, very well known to this day, like million, million seller. And I was on stage with her and uh, I just got married and my mother-in-law was in the crowd and we were playing a song, just me and her. And I was harmonizing and she, she heard me harmonizing. So she came with the mic with me like this. And at the end, we looked each other in the eyes and I kissed her and she kissed back. Never kissed the lead singer when it's the solo artist, but she kissed back. And my mother-in-law thought that was quite funny. She told my wife, you know, you kissed the singer tonight. Really? Oh, okay. I never got called back. Uh, <laughs> and that's when I started Fogo. So I didn't get the call back. I didn't get the call back because I kissed the lead singer on stage. It's you a see, beautiful moment. You know, but you know, Francois, that's, you know, things always happen for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, there's no such thing as a mistake. There's no such thing as a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence. You know, you decided to do that, and that happened. Then you would not have been in this position doing all the great things that you guys are doing. Yeah, think about you know, it. There's, there's a whole bunch of things like that uh, that mm. occur. Pierre and I were discussing that the other day. So I remember when we were younger in the Brasca Marat band. There's a few instances where we truly, truly thought we wanted something. We wanted something to occur in a big way, and we tried our best to do it, and it didn't happen. And years later, we realized, thank God, that never actually occurred. It was actually not the universe trying to mess me up; it was the universe trying to protect me. <laughs> there you go. I mean, like it, it, it was it was a good thing because it. And sometimes you, so it's difficult to know when to hold them, when to fold them. The Kenny Rogers thing, right? Because sometimes it's really difficult. Should I stop? Maybe there's a sign. Well, maybe you have to go further. So then that's what life is. You don't know. Should I go further? Am I this close to the diamond mine? Or if I beat the dead dog? And that's where the art of life occurs. And there's no good or right answer. It'll just create a new thing that happens. And then you you play the cards that are dealt you. But, but uh, sometimes things don't happen for a reason. And 
thank God that they didn't happen. Even if you want very, them. Very well said. And, and you know, this, it's not a coincidence. Either way, you know, I, I don't believe in coincidences. There are things that come your way. You, you go to the right or the left. And, and sometimes these are triggers, one way or the other. And you just got to keep going because that's where you should, you always are where you should be, right? Well, you know, I've made a little rule. I haven't told this to anybody. This is about, eh, I'm thinking going on 20 years. I respect this new rule most times, and it almost always pays dividends. And what it is, is when I'm leaving, let's say I'm leaving my building here, and I know I got to go right. I know I have to go to the subway for whatever reason. I got to take the subway. It happens that I leave the building for whatever reason. I've gone the wrong way, right? And I've realized, hey, my subconscious is powerful. Let me keep going. There may be something. So whenever I, I'm doing something that I wasn't planning on doing, it's not me that's forgetful. Maybe it's me trying to help me, my other me trying to help me. And I actually pursue the wrong thing a lot of times. And I can't tell you how many times it actually pans out the right way. It wasn't, it wasn't me forgetting. It was my other me saying, you idiot. Go this way. There's something better this way. So I actually follow, follow it down, and it's really remarkable what happens. You have to have the balls to do it, though. But it's really, and sometimes when I go back and I think I'm, I'm missing something. Well, most probably you are. So I actually take the time, and sure enough, yeah, forgot my glasses. Uh, did you did did you do some some work with Santana as well? Um, we did. Wentz, we yeah. we did the same thing with uh, Speakeasy. Speakeasy, yeah. Yeah, and that was interesting. Who was, oh, it was Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte, he picked Harry Belafonte to be his interview. So we asked Carlos, hey, do you want to do this interview on PBS? He said, yes. <laughs> Who do you want to interview you? Harry Belafonte. That was wow. amazing. So that was just crazy, uh, very spiritual. I was also involved in a show when I was at the internet company. We filmed a festival in Germany where he was playing. So we... Uh, we filmed Santana, but we didn't do any editing or mixing on that one. But uh, That's where Pierre nearly died in a car crash because he had rented a super speedy car and it was on the Nuremberg ring. And he decided, well, the stage is at one end of the Nuremberg ring. I got to go to the other one. I'm just going to drive on the racetrack in the middle no, of miles an hour. I was told I have to go all the way around. Yeah, yeah, whatever. He, he drives on the racetrack and takes the traction control off because he thinks he's a god. And then he realizes that traction control can actually save your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but he lived to tell. You live to tell the tale. Yes. It's great. Harry Belafonte was another great visionary. I mean, he was... Uh, I remember having conversations with his percussionist, who was Ralph McDonald, by the way. Oh, okay. The great Ralph McDonald. That's where he got a lot of his ideas and training because as they did this tour, and he was um, one of those guys that always explored. And he would, they would land somewhere, go to Jamaica or somewhere, and he would tell, every, uh, specifically Ralph, go out and find some interesting things, some explore. So they would all come back and bring back, uh, you know, musical information. And he would always push that envelope. That's beautiful. Yeah. He's and, quite, and, I mean, quite a special, special yeah. human being, for sure. Oh, yeah. Harry, yeah. Extraordinary. I mean, you know, that... that as much as people are equal, I mean, people are equal in, in, in many ways, but in the eyes I, of God, I, you mean. in the eyes of God, yeah. but I have to say, we've met some extraordinary people, extraordinary human beings with extraordinary talent, sometimes extraordinary talent jerks, but extraordinary talent though, you know, and sometimes we meet nice people that aren't so talented, but, uh, but we've been fortunate to work with some really, really, really high level people. And, and it really raises our bar in terms of expectations. You were talking about that the other day. Wow, it, it's, I, I call it the baseline. So <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, I always strove for excellence, Aldo, and I know you, you, you did too. And uh, some people would call me on it. You know, I'd be in the studio, uh, this is not an SSL, you want an SSL mix, you're crazy your attention to detail, but I, I got to know when to hold them, when to fold them. I knew when to be not this control freak that never ever gets done, but raising the bar. And there's a fine line of that thing. And you sort of develop that over time. And, but you don't know what the other guys, here, here's the problem with drummers, not percussionists, drummers. Problem with drummers 
a lot of them don't get the chance to play with other drummers. Guitar players can play with other guitar players, but drummers rarely play with another drummer in a long period of time. <coughs> but guitar players, yeah, but a whole bunch of other problems. So one, but they can learn and they can hear how the other guy sounds in all situations in a hotel room. So they get to know the other guitar players a little bit more. But when you're a drummer and you're trying to get the one instrument, make it sound like one instrument, you realize that most drummers don't have that down. So for me, being a drummer in my own little way, but it extends to all instruments, it's the bass line. I've been beside Neil Peart's kit as I'm miking it, and Neil plays. Oh, that's how that sounds. Okay. I've been miking Ian Pace's kit. Oh, that's how that sounds. There's no mics. I, I'm beside it. Oh, that's how that animal sounds. Oh, okay. Terry Bosio, I've been miking his kit. Oh, that's how that sounds. Oh, okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the great drummers we work with. So I get a sense of, yeah, so when I see somebody playing drums, man, your snare is way too loud or your toms are way too low when you play. Like it's not a balanced kit because I can have a frame of reference. Or Winton Marsalis, when he plays trumpet beside you, I've never heard trumpet. That's how that sounds. Or when Branford plays or when Harry Connick is beside the piano, hey, Pierre Francois, check this out. And he sings and plays piano. Oh, that's how that sounds. I have a baseline of excellence. So when I hear other things, you're going to have to trust me. So when people come to see me, my daughter, she's not ready yet, or my son, I know. Or you know what? This is extraordinary because I've inherited through hard work and I have a baseline of comparison. And sure. that's really important. And that's where producers come in. Eventually, like, you know, you become a producer. That's how you become a good producer. You know how to raise the, you know, you got to raise it up. Well, you know what? This is great. And that's the measure of baseline of excellence. You know, when to stay away, stay out. Let it, yes. I had a session last week in Nashville and musicians were extraordinary. And, you know, make some suggestions. We shape the forms. We do different intro, different things. But, um, you know, I'm not one to tell them how to play. I mean, they know how to play. You just stay out of the way. Well, it's a baseline. I mean, but, but, but it's knowing where the excellence is. Yeah, exactly. Recognizing and, it and, 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 and honoring it. And, and But using it to help yourself too and other people. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, that, rem that, re that, that reminds me of, uh, I mean, you've seen the, the Beatles um, documentary. Yeah. Yeah. It was always, a, I mean, it was a mystery to me how Ringo would come up with the parts. Did someone <laughs> tell him? Would did you know, because that, that I mean, that is God, uh, God given genius. I mean, what 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 he he did. But you would, I would watch to see if somebody would say something, or did they cut out the parts? And and of course, um, nobody told anybody anything. <laughs> All of them. And when they did, George left. <laughs> yeah. No, no. And it, and it was a fact. I mean, when you look at that, the only one who advanced a little bit was Paul McCartney. Would make some suggestions. But most of the time, people of that level, their greatness is because you stay out of the way and you let them be, you let their minds create it. Because the moment you suggest something, you're actually interfering with that possible genius level. Um, and and I, that, was, that was interesting to watch because coming up with parts like uh, Get Back, you know, oh my God, like, he was, you know, I remember this. He's watching and saying, well, I have to know. And, of course, Greg Bizanet, who's Ringo's drummer, uh, would, you know, confirmed it to me. Uh, that's what happens. Nobody would say anything. It would just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And at some point, the next rehearsal, something is different. And you notice in that particular uh, situation, he would play different. And by the end, it sounded like that. So what happened in between? This is just an example, but... But you're uh, right, uh, Pierre, about staying staying out. When people are of, the, are of that level, you know, just let them let them be. You know, right? Well, but recognize it too. I call it the Pee Wee Coach conundrum. So my son played hockey at a, he plays at a very high level, but he he for a whole bunch of reasons he was operated. He missed the tryouts. He got put in you know the crappy level, and so I, I've been through the crappy levels all the way to, to the top of hockey. And the Pee Wee Coach conundrum is 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 precisely what you said. Okay, guys, you're going to go on the ice. I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this. Okay, go over there, go over here, go over there, go over here, go over there, go over here. Then the little kid, hmm? <laughs> and he, he takes the puck and he starts, good, 
Not like that. Book up so oh, he scores. Okay. Simoso. And so every time he would tell the kid, okay, you score a fast, nice pass. No, no, not like that. At some point, if you spot the kids are good, quit freaking doing this to them and let them freaking go, man. And the same thing with, with, with music. And that's where the baseline is. You spotted sort of something good. You know what? This kid, he's got something here. Let's foster that. But you're able to spot the little shiny thing that most people don't know and they just want to put it down. So playing in a band where you're all equals, you sort of let stuff go and you develop your own style because, you know, it, it just sort of happens, which is very different from a bad teacher, which is trying to, you know, knock off all the, you know, make it all like this. It's, it's difficult, man. And, and everybody has their path. Yeah. It's very, very difficult. You have to survive along the way, not yeah. get crushed. It's and. Hard. Talking about like what uh, the past, like what what are you guys working on now that's interesting that you can talk about? Well, uh, I could talk about a personal thing. Is I uh, during the pandemic, I uh, decided to re-engineer my whole right hand. I equated to like when Neil Peart, you know, match grip. He decided to to to, to change. Not that I'm pretending that I'm the Neil Peart of the guitar. What I mean is is that late in my career, I decided to completely change my way of playing. Yes. And the reason the reason I did it is I was always I, I know who I am and know who I'm not. It's nothing about cockiness. I know I was a, a very dexterous in my playing, and in spite of that, I was very physical when I played, extremely physical, especially when I was soloing with my right hand. And I was faster than most, more precise than most. But it was at the edge of not being able to do it. And I, as I'm getting older, I realized there's no way I'll be able to sustain this later on in life and i saw steve morse that he had to completely his hands all his right hands all screwed up now and he can't play he had to re-engineer the way he plays he has to wear a glove because he he, he was so physical and he used to play in a weird kind of way it affected him so i said i'm not going to let that happen to me and now i've completely relearned my right hand and it's i can play much faster than i used to believe it or not and it's effortless yeah. And I got that from, but the, the funny thing is, is I remember reading a Joe Pass book when I was 14 and he spoke about the way to achieve what I've done. So I, I remembered, I go, I'm going to try what Joe Pass spoke about in that book that I used to have. The other thing is that I, I dated this physiotherapist when I was 24 and she wanted to learn how to, how to play guitar. And I, I taught her and she started picking in a weird way. And I looked at her and go, I've never seen anybody pick like that before. And instead of doing this, she would pick, she would rotary like this. And I remember speaking to Eric Johnson, Pierre and I went to meet him one time. And I, I remember asking him a little question because I had heard that he was interested in the rotary way. And had he, he would, when he do it over again, he would do it that way. And I go, that's the girl that I dated. So I started doing the rotary way. Oh my God, it's, it's effortless. So that's something I'm really proud of in the last couple of years. Like I, I, I'm still a musician. I'm still trying to grow. I'm still trying to learn. So I'm, I'm really proud of that on a business level, on the artistic level. Well, the pandemic was rough to Pierre and I, because live concert events were very few and far between. And the ones that were there, people weren't necessarily motivated to capture them in any meaningful way. And as we're getting out of it, you know, they're saying, well, we're not really in shape. The crowds are still masked. So it's been a bit, bit rough, but we did do a couple of really nice operas and we, we did a, some Broadway stuff, which was great. And uh, we did. Well, we have the big opera coming in November with the Opera in Montreal. It's called the La Beauté du Monde. And, and, uh, and, and we did Kismet in Santa Barbara. And, and you did stuff in Nashville. We did Emmy Lou Harris, which was a, a, a lot of fun for a charity thing. And we, we've done a bunch of different things. But right now, why don't you talk about the hip hop? Well, we, uh, like Francois said earlier, we have, uh, we have the Tragically Hips complete collection. All their tapes, all their demos, their cassettes, the rough mixes. Their like 4,000 items. 4,500. When we started, they said, we have about 1,200 items. And it was like biblical. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. <laughs> so uh, so we set up our studio again because we did the same thing for Rush. We, we did that for eight years. Well, no, more than that. It was it, it, uh, Officially, we were the Rush people for 17 years. 17 years, yeah. You catalog well, all the Rush Yep. Yeah, every single recording they've ever done, we transmitted it into digital for posterity. And uh, 
so we've we've developed an expertise on that and we've developed we've acquired all the machinery you need from the late 60s all the way to today yeah. all the two inch tape quarter inch tape this tape that tape this format that format we have all the machines in mint condition nice. uh, and, uh, so yeah. that's what we're doing for the hip we're doing that for the hip we probably have another year's worth of work i would think yeah. now eventually talking getting uh, talking about russia with neil peart when he came to cosa uh, i finally convinced him he he, he had never done this do a, a, a drum a, wor a, a workshop or of any kind or a clinic or or being there and he and i had been friends for for many many years and we're in, in different projects but at one point uh, i convinced him to come to to cosa as a special guest right and uh so he he came he showed up and every, every year we would have a a surprise guest and of course this one i couldn't i promised him that i wouldn't let anybody know so he showed up <laughs> you room. had 10,000 people all of a sudden. <laughs> no, no, we, we we couldn't let anybody know. So. No, of course not, because you would have had the whole... You would have had 10,000 yeah. people. It would have been, it would have been, and, and also he was very private, as you know. Right. And um, I said, just, just for fun, just to so say, we'll, we'll be, you know, maybe 60, 70 people in, in the room. We'll all be on stage. We'll, we'll set this up. And I thought we we're just going to do conversation. And uh, he happened to be, he was living in LA at the time, but he happened to visit his house in, in the Laurentians here near Montreal. He says, yeah, I'm, I'm here for two weeks. Perfect timing. I'll come down. So he was just going to, we were just going to talk. We we're just going to have an interview kind of like this and talk about different things or, you know, uh, go down some rabbit holes or whatever. But then he, he called me back and he said, you know, I have a better idea. I'm working on my DVD. Why don't we play? Mm. And then I said, okay, sure. But then I would have to tell our technicians. <laughs> yeah. And if I told the technicians, so then I had to figure out at what point I could tell the technicians that we could have everything set up. And so what I did was um, uh, I got some of the other guys, the artists who were on site to play parts. And I put a, an African ensemble together. And I said, so Neil, you'll, you'll play some djembe and we'll have fun with that. And we'll play some drums. We'll have everything set up, and we'll improvise the whole thing. So I have that uh, filmed. That's beautiful. And one of these days, it's going to be one of these uh, episodes when the time, when the right, right time comes. Just uh, amazing, you know. It's 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 something that I I tell people when I when I heard Neil play the first time when we worked with him, and you know, I one of the claim to fames that we have that I have is until two thousand three or four. Uh, Neil had never been recorded one-to-one, -one, meaning a mic per instrument that he had because of track count. It was physically impossible. So when we did R30, I had 48 tracks just for the drums. The R30, the the, yeah. that whole video is... Uh... 48 tracks, just the drums. Uh, it was the first time that it was all spread out because, you know, but, but it's okay to make choices too. And, the, and they did great jobs in the old days. So, okay, look, you, you got 5,000 toms. We have two tracks for toms. We're going to do a stereo mix left, right of toms. And you did, you worked really hard in getting the sub mix and that's fine. But we were able to record it. So as I was going to check the mics and uh, Brad Maddox was the life of the, the, the front of the house guy for Russia at the time. And he had mic'd the whole thing up. And I, I wanted to go see where things are and everything else. And he was playing. And it, what really struck me was when he would go to his toms, his toms would speak. Because uh, some people, when they go to the toms, it's... This was like... It, it, it was really speaking. And it was extremely clear sounding. And there was no ambiguity no. of anything. It was non-ambiguous. No, every note was... Oh, my God. Not out. I never, I never heard something like that before because you know he knows what he's going to play and he plays it, and he used to make the, the thing I'm a butcher and people thought he was being very bad. Well, you're butchering. No, no, it's not that. A butcher, he he hits the cut of meat and it's clean, it's extremely clean. It's not a butcher and he's butchering. People didn't understand what he meant, but he meant that I cut, I cut it clean, man. It's like a sharp knife and it's there. There's no. No question. <laughs> no, it, it was very deliberate and then beautiful sound. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that was great. And this, in this instance, it was what, after he got more comfortable improvising and whatever we decided, it was like totally improvised. So we played, 
you know, we played, I showed him some djembe things. He played with us there, then went on to the kit. And we, you know, we generally had fun with it. Totally unplanned. We just went with it, you know, wow. and, and, and then we, we spoke and uh, he was amazing. And then he, uh, you know, he says, oh, we got to do this again, you know. <laughs> and then the whole plan was to do it again in Cuba, but that didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. yeah. But yeah. at least, at least, you know, we have, we have reference. We have that, that reference that it can be done and, and, the, and the mindset to be able to, uh, not to keep it for you, but to share it. Yeah. And, and and involve and push everybody else to think that way. You know, well, not you know, about to us. Your, to your point earlier, although I, you know, Pierre and I were privy to something that there's only got to be a few people that have heard this. When we were doing the Rush archives, we were privy to all the demos. Not all of them, but most of the demos, because that's what we're doing. We're archiving this whole thing. So just to put you in context, their whole catalog, let's say if you play it back to back, there's you know about 10 hours worth of recorded music take the live albums away, but it's about 10 hours to, to produce those 10 hours of recorded or, or released music. You would have to listen 10 hours a day, five days a week for 10 weeks. That's what the parts. So there's a lot of stuff that never made it out. Obviously they're, they're building it. And one of the interesting creative lineages that you go through was Tom Sawyer. So I heard the first demos of how I went here and the, and, and you hear the parts evolving but it's over many months. And to your point where nobody's telling each other what to do, Neil's working on his stuff, Getty's working on his stuff. There's, there's one version of Tom Sawyer where Alex, I kid you not, the solo, it's like, it basically starts at the bottom end of the neck, but it goes all the way up. Oh, and all the way back. I mean, it's, it, he's exploring stuff. The lyrics aren't right. And eventually it starts, it starts coalescing, the tempo changes, it slowed it up and slowed down. And eventually it becomes to, they got something here and then they recorded that as the thing. Now, most people that do records, like our records that we released with Bosque and Arad, we had, you know, it was basically their demos knowing now, I mean, it, it wasn't fully baked yet. There was one or two takes, but they would really finally craft the stuff and they would each evolve their things themselves. And it would this beautiful coalescence into the final version, but hearing the, build up to how it was built was very um rewarding yeah. on an artistic level uh that's no, amazing. amazing it's amazing yeah no, I, he showed me i was in the studio when they recorded their last album and uh -huh. uh, he was showing me the um I, I went down to toronto and he says come on down because we were talking about the cuba uh thing so i he invited me down to discuss how would we do this and all of that's while they were finishing their studio album their last one and uh, so I got to see how they were they were working. One is in another room. He's on his computer. One's sending something, and, and they they were bringing their own different parts to to this. It was quite a process, but very brilliant uh, composition to the word, to the image, to the to the sound, to the notes, to uh, like everything has a, had a relevance, and it's amazing. I mean. Yeah, I mean, what you guys are he we're hearing in those must have been, ama must well, be amazing. Well, it evolved over time, too, because in some of the records, you know, they didn't have budget. I mean, like the first Rush record. Uh, <laughs> they shared a well, tape with yeah. another band. Yeah, well, so I got the tape and I put it on. And I go, what the hell is this thing? What the hell is this? It wasn't Rush at all. They, they had to share the tape with another band that they were working on. So they went from, like, you know, <laughs> not having been able to afford a tape to unlimited funds of budget to allocate the records. But in the middle there, <clears throat> Neil supposedly got annoyed because he, um, and I heard the stuff, I didn't hear the arguments, but I, I heard the, I don't know if they're arguments, but there were discussions. And he's like, hold on a second, guys, we record, we build our parts, we do our thing, it's everything is great. And then we record it and we do the best job we can. Then you, Getty, and you, Alex, you're going on to do all these over dubs now, all more keyboards, all more guitars and everything else. And then I hear and I go, oh, my God, had I known you were going to do that, I would have played differently here because I didn't have those parts. Because Well, we didn't have them, Neil, because we didn't invent them yet. And we we're overdubbing. So it got to the point where he said, fine, I'll play my drums last. And there's records where he, he you know, so they recorded the overdub and he redid the drums at the end because he had all the things and all the vocals and all the stuff to do it to. So that, that's an interesting, yeah. you know, movement of creativity. Yeah. 
Very, very interesting. But listen, I, I, Pierre and uh, Francois, I, I, we can go on for days, for yeah. weeks. <laughs> and we will, but breaking bread. Of course. Of course. So I'll, as I say, I really thank you for, 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 uh, for joining us and, and, and documenting this. Now we, can, we, we have it down and we have this conversation down. But we'll have to continue breaking bread for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, well, and thank you. Them. And as thank I always you. say, to be continued. To be continued. Thank, thank you so much. And don't forget to subscribe and share.